Hello, data leaders. Today, I have a fantastic guest on the show, Orion de Jong. We just prepared my, my Dutch pronunciation. I hope I delivered it well. Orion, welcome to the show. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Orion, today we're going to talk about a few exciting topics with regards to data leadership, building relationship within the company, positioning data and analytics the right way. But before we jump in, would you mind giving a few, in, uh, a few words of introduction to the audience members who don't know you already? Where do you work right now and what is your job role? Yeah, so I work for uh, Vattenfall, uh, which is a Swedish energy company, European company. Uh, we have our core markets in the Netherlands, in Sweden and in Germany. Um, and within procurement, I'm the head of solutions and analytics, which is a bit of a mix of uh, responsibilities um, uh, in the data and analytics field financial, uh, but also innovation and the supplier relationship management. Mm. And how did you get into this role? So how long have you been in the, in the data analytics space? Yeah, so my, my career has been uh, one of many surprises and uh, I'm definitely not your typical uh, data and analytics uh, guy. Um, I've been working in data, data and analytics since, uh, since five years ago. Uh, before that, I used to be in the insurance industry in, in, in customer service work. I used to lead uh, uh, customer service departments. Um, uh, uh, so, so formally speaking, I've been involved with data analytics since five years. Mm -hmm. Informally, I've always been a big fan of uh, looking at numbers and trying to find the patterns. And uh, I, I, I even recall, I was thinking about this while preparing for the interview. I even recall being really, really young and uh, sitting in the canteen of the soccer uh, club uh, watching the stock uh, prices and, and trying to find uh, patterns in that. So it's been a part of my life. Um, uh, I've always tried to apply it in work. Uh, for example, in one of my first jobs, uh, we tried to find patterns in, uh, the, 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 um, in the arrival of new healthcare claims uh, at the company, uh, trying to predict workflow. So yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's been part of my life. And being in analytics now is only just a realization of something that should have already happened before, I guess. Oh, interesting. So maybe we can spend just a few minutes on the connections between data analytics and your previous roles, because this is, yeah. this is very common that the most successful data analytics leaders actually have wide backgrounds. You know, rarely do you have this really strict, narrow data analytics informatics background. And when mm -hmm. you can cross fertilize a breadth of experience, usually good things happen. So with yeah. you, customer service, people would think that you mentioned that you were working with customer service. People would think that, yeah, that probably doesn't have too much to do with uh, data. It's just people and talking and interpersonal relationships. Uh, but of course, we see this convergence of people and technology. So uh, did you see some writings on the wall, even when you were working in customer service in the previous roles uh, of how data can be utilized to improve quality of service and that, that sort of thing? Absolutely. And, and not just from a productivity perspective, but um, I mean, I'm really old, uh, 44 years old. Um, uh, and um, when, when I started working with data, uh, I mean, we didn't really have the tools to do very complex things. Um, so we were already happy that we could measure productivity. Uh, we could measure the amount of calls incoming, um, uh, maybe register even what kind of calls you would receive from your customers and then try to optimize that. But later on, um, we, we tried to, uh, well, to include behavioral aspects into the things that we were doing with data. So for example, trying to understand uh, how salespeople can be more successful uh, with specific types of households, um, uh, which are more suitable for the way they do, they do their sales, for example. Um, we tried to figure out, well, which kind of households would be uh, most suitable to go to and, 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 and try to pitch uh, sustainable energy. So as soon as we developed this computing power and had more data fields uh, that we could use for our business, uh, it became really interesting to do more than just, well, just uh, uh, confirm or validate what the business already thought uh, and start working more on the predictive uh, side of things and, and also try to predict the things that the business could not think of, right? I think a data mm -hmm. professional is not only working uh, uh, based on business demand, um, but also tries to incorporate some kind of a vision based on previous experiences in what he's doing. Mm. And then what brought you to data analytics specifically? What made you decide that, okay, I, I, I want to jump all in 
I, I, I want to go all into data. Well, in all honesty, it was a bit of a coincidence that I'm now responsible for data and analytics in procurement because that was not part of my portfolio when I joined procurement. Uh, but there was a reorg and, and, and I just got into my portfolio. People knew that I was interested in numbers and in data and in trying to predict the future. They already knew I had a very, well, diverse background. I mean, uh, insurance and energy operations, uh, business development. But, but uh, I went to law school, right? Not your typical data and analytics uh, education, I would say. Um, uh, and, and then, yeah, things just progressed and it's, it's, I mean, uh, I guess you can be successful if you do the things that you really like. And I really mm -hmm. like working with numbers and trying to understand the past in order to predict the future. And the opportunities will come to you. And then, absolutely. And then, what do you do exactly now? So, can you give us a little bit of a panorama of your role right now, your current projects, and also maybe how your role evolved over the past couple of years? I think uh, in, 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 the, in procurement in particular, um, uh, I'm more working on some basic things that you need to have uh, uh, in order uh, to be successful in analytics. So we're working on the basics like uh, setting up the right governance, um, setting up the right rules, uh, making sure that everyone has access to specific data, et cetera. Um, if, if you look at the analytics part, then of course, being in procurement, uh, we want to know everything about our suppliers, about supplier risk, uh, but also, of course, about how much money we spend on these suppliers and, um, uh, and, and well, what kind of opportunities we can get from that. Um, so, um, so, so spend information is always very interesting uh, and, and learning from that. Uh, I do hope that uh, as we progress and as we grow in, in, in maturity, uh, I can also work towards the more exotic uh, uh, things you can imagine in procurement, like I mean, we, we do a lot of negotiations and mm. I'm still curious if, for example, uh, weather type and temperature uh, are influential when it comes to being successful in getting a better uh, price from your uh, suppliers, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's very far-fetched, uh, but I think also these kinds of things, especially because they include the behavioral aspect of supplier and, and buyer, uh, can be very interesting to, to look into. But that's really something for the future. For now, we're working on the basics working on expanding the team and, and, and showing that you can do a lot of things uh, with data, even when it's still very basic. Mm -hmm. And I know that before you get into the more exotic stuff and, uh, and the really exciting stuff, um, you need to do this groundwork, um, yeah. which in and of itself can be and is a great challenge. Um, what were the main challenges for you as, as you came into the role and now you're building the team? You're setting everything up. Uh, what are the main challenges that you encounter on a on a day to day basis? So I think the first uh, important challenge that we had is that um, procurement wasn't really data driven. I mean, it was of course a data driven department, and we were making our decisions based on the data that we have. But there were no data scientists, analysts, or or whatever in in procurement um, uh, two years ago. And I think uh, what we did is we, we, we tried to um, uh, focus on implementing the right software and the right tools that would allow us to do all those analytics um, uh, quite easily. Uh, but that has not always been very successful. Um, so, so two years ago when I joined and we started working on data and analytics, uh, that was the most important challenge, getting the right people on board. Um, I think the challenge now is to make sure that uh, uh, in such a big company like Vattafall is, right, we are with 20,000 throughout different uh, European countries. Uh, and Europe might be one continent, but it's 28 countries and, and a multitude of different cultures. Um, uh, the biggest challenge now is to, to align on what is data and analytics. How do you work with that? What are the preferred ways of working? Um, how do we set up a successful collaboration? How do we arrange all the technical things? How do we make sure that we invest in skills and what kind of skills? Uh, so, so it's really groundwork still. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next challenge of the future will be, uh, how can we keep up the pace of the industry developments in our own company? Uh, so how can we leverage what we already do in other business units in Valtafal, where people might be more advanced or more mature? Um, uh, and, and then still the question is, are we capable as a company to follow the, the industry developments? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's going fast and, and corporates are not really known for being very fast. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's, that's, of course, a challenge.
So you're touching on an important point here. And I will have a few questions about how do you think that the data analytics function is currently being perceived within the organization? And then how would you like it to be uh, viewed? And what kind of position do you envision for data within the company? But maybe we can touch on the larger industry industry trends first. So mm -hmm. how do you see data right now? You mentioned that these big corporates are not too fast to respond and react, which is, you know, only natural uh, due to the sheer size of these businesses. But what do you say is the major developments in the industry? In We can even just look at the past five, 10 years. And how do you see these big companies reacting? And where are the gaps in the development? Well, um, interesting question. Um, I think... Um, I think I think uh, let's start with the current uh, uh, developments, and uh, it's of course fantastic to see that all this uh, computing power now leads to um, new tools that will allow us to do more complex things uh, with the data that we have. Um, of course, with so many suppliers on the market offering me very interesting data solutions, uh, the question is is still do I have all this data in order to use those tools successfully? Um, so, 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 so the first thing I see is, um, are the developments in the industry um, uh, not going a little bit too fast for the majority of the companies that want to work with data? Can we keep up uh, and can we use the tools to the best of, of their abilities? And uh, knowing that we don't always have the data or the right infrastructure in place to, to use them. Um, another in, uh, thing I see in the industry is, um, and that has more to do with maybe not, not so much the solution itself, but more about the industry itself. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's still, uh, as Professor Bostrom once said during a conference, it's still a sea of dudes, right? And, and um, um, uh, as a company that strongly promotes diversity, um, I would like to have more women um, uh, uh, in the data and analytics space in Wattenfall, um, uh, because uh, I think that's very good for the development of the discipline, but also for what we do with data in our company. Um, and then if I, if I look at the far future, well, I'm just curious um, uh, what all these developments will bring. For example, Web3, uh, if we all work together in the, in the metaverse later on, what does that mean for how we use data and how we visualize it, for example? And what does that do with accessibility? If you have this uh, online technological environment in which you work, where you might have different security requirements. Um, in preparation for this interview, I read an article from the Dutch security services who warned us about um, uh, quantum computing, uh, which um, uh, more or less uh, kills all the security measures that you currently have in place. Right? So, so, um, so for me, the, 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 the central theme of the developments in the industry is it's going so fast. What does it mean? Can we keep up? Mm -hmm. And how is data being perceived right now in Wattenfall? Obviously, it's been going through an evolution, but I know that this perception just takes time for people. So even now, what, what, what we are perceiving is that uh, there has been all this buzz around data and a lot of hype. And you can actually ride that wave. And I think that definitely happened. But uh, the data-driven organization itself we see it in only very, very few cases. I mean, of course, when you have a company like Netflix, which is built on data, that's a whole different conversation. But when you have a uh, 50, 100-year-old business that is yeah. used to doing uh, um, their day-to-day -day in a particular way, they still haven't really implemented data in a really profound, meaningful way. So how do you how do you see that at Watan Farm? Um, if you wanted to really... And nail down the degree of data drivenness within Mattenfall. How would you how would you describe it? Well, I think it's very high. Um, um, and if you look at what we do, right? We produce, trade, um, distribute, and supply energy. Then data is is very much at the core of the things that we do. Um, we, we operate our plants uh, with the help of data, and we optimize uh, them with that. Uh, trading uh, energy is, is, is very much data-driven, of course. Uh, we have uh, algorithms doing trading of, uh, themselves without almost any human supervision anymore. So I think, I think we, are, um, uh, we are very mature when it comes to using, using data at the core of what we do. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, if you ask a data professional and 
if you ask someone creative like me what you could do with data, then I guess the answer is, could also be that we're never satisfied with what we do with data. Um, so there's always more to get, right? I mean, there's always something to wish for. But in general, I think we do a very good job with data in Rotterdam. Data is at the core of what we do, uh, ranging from, from, from the hardcore energy processes to, um, uh, to, the, to the newer things that we do, which is more uh, about sustainability, uh, sustainability of suppliers, sustainability of clients, which is also a very data-driven um, uh, business at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then um, from your perspective, why is that? You know, the, the, the old question of why. So was it because of executive buying from, from the top? Was it because there was uh, like a great effort done in educating the business on a wide scale? What was the core of that success of making sure that the uh, data is really at the heart of what and file? Yeah, I, I don't want to turn this into a promotional talk for, for the company, but uh, it's, it's great fun to work for this company because uh, um, uh, executives are very much involved with the latest trends and, and with new developments. Um, uh, and then they leave you a lot of um, freedom and independence to start doing experiments yourself. And ultimately, of course, these, these experiments and the results from them keep come, come floating to the surface uh, and, and more and more people see it and more and more people want to copy it. So take, for example, an RPA initiative, um, uh, which is what we've done in one of our business units. Uh, uh, people are super transparent and open to share those results with the others and we can easily uh, copy, uh, copy those, um, those experiments. Um, so so I, think, um, uh, I think we're just very fortunate with the fact that we... Um, that we that we can do what we want to do with data uh, and that we're allowed to support the development of the business even though it's 100 years old uh, with new trends uh, because everyone knows of course that the more data you have uh, the more you can understand what has happened in the past and the better you can predict the future so it's i think it's in, it's between everyone it's in everyone's mind uh, that you that you that you should really use the data in order to be successful in the future Mm -hmm. And then what role of leadership uh, someone like you takes in that whole data-driven development? So I understand that it's great to have the executive buy-in, but you still have a different and more uh, aspirational vision for what you can do with data within bottom file. And yeah. uh, how do you go about leading that charge? Uh, and what yeah. kind of role do you play? And do you have some strategic allies in the company? How is that structured? Yeah, well, I read the other day about uh, Machiavelli who said uh, realism is the highest form of idealism. Mm. Uh, so, so I'm a realistic. Uh, and, and the reality is that I work in procurement, uh, which is still paid for by the business. Uh, so I, I largely work on business demand. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and that's also what we should do. I mean, there are plenty of things we still need to look into and discover before we can move to the more exotic things. Um, uh, and, and for me, that means that uh, there's a challenge in understanding the role of the business and understanding what it is exactly that they do um, uh, and, and the uh, trying to understand their language more or less, uh, but also trying to make them understand what the data language is. So sometimes I feel like Google Translate, right? I try, I try to bring those languages together in order to make sure that we get successful combinations that can help solve business issues or, 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 um, uh, or find opportunities. Um, so, so besides uh, having some idea of what the technology is all about and understanding how processes work, for me, it really is all about speaking the language um, and making sure that you, that, you, that, you, that you deliver on these results that the business really needs and the better you do that, the more they will leave you room for experimentation, which is where you can really make a difference. Mm. And if you reflect, um, yeah, go ahead. No, maybe one more thing. Um, uh, it's 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 great to have a vision, um, uh, but it's I think it's even better to just deliver results. So so we aim to think big, right? Uh, we we aim to think creatively, and we aim to 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 realize these big things in the future. But we also understand that it goes in small steps. Uh, I already talked about the pace of the average corporate, not always the fastest. So, um, so we understand that we need to take small steps um, uh, and deliver real results that everyone understands uh, in order to make bigger steps. Mm. 
So this is so important and it always comes up, this idea of focusing on providing value for the business, also speaking their language. So a lot of times you as a data leader, you're just translating between different sides of the business. And when you can really uh, take that position as a conductor and someone who makes things happen and mm -hmm. drawing these connections that no one else can see, you know, and you have the tools, you have the know-how of the technology, and you're able to present that in a digestible way that the business can take on board and utilize. Now, that's where you can actually bring a lot of value to the company. Yeah. So, that, and, and that's fantastic. What do you think were your keys for success in this? So when you go about your day job, you look at your objectives, you look at what you want to achieve as you start building relationships as you start talking to people. Uh, what do you think are the keys here? So th this is also the conversation about the qualities of the data leader, right? Yeah. So when we talk about empathy, the kind of questions that you ask, your general posture and attitude, um, what do you think that are the keys for success here? Yeah, I don't know if there's one uh, winning formula that goes for all, um, but for me, um, it really works um, that that I listen a lot. Um, uh, I'm perfectly happy with uh, accepting business demands and realizing them, knowing that it might take some time before I can start on the more exotic things, which may be more fun for the team to work on. Um, uh, but that's for me important, this focus on, on validating the business uh, and, 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 and their choices, uh, because ultimately, of course, uh, they are the ones who pay for my uh, budget. Um, uh, so this realization is very important when you when you start one of those conversations. Um, and and then I think in my case, I like to stay below the radar a bit. Mm -hmm. um, um, also because I don't want to make things more confusing than they already are when you talk about data. I mean, not everyone speaks the data language. So let's not try to overcomplicate things. Because, they, because every manager or leader already has to speak a lot of different languages. Um, so if, if I can just let the results speak, then that's already good enough for me because that allows me to, like I said before, that allows me to do some other things than just uh, the basics, so to say. Um, uh, then, then I also think it's important that you every now and then try to, to float a new idea with one of those executives, right? The, the what if question. Um, uh, what if we would uh, try to combine different data sources and see what kind of results we get from that? Uh, what if you want to try another experiment? What if you want to try another technology? Um, um, uh, and, and I think what, what is in my case successful is that I'm, I always come across as super curious uh, and, 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 and hopefully I can bring some of that enthusiasm that I have for finding out new truths um, uh, uh, also makes others enthusiastic. And I think that's my formula. Curiosity, imagination, um, next to understanding the business and what needs to be delivered now. And I think that's a very interesting mix. Mm, okay, and th that's a good question, actually. What you mentioned about how they pay your budget. And then uh, what do they actually pay you for? Do they pay you for just uh, delivering on certain needs and demands? Or do they pay you to come forth proactively with new ideas and do the legwork of pushing that through in the organization. It's always a combination of humility and assertiveness. And this yeah. is actually a, a very common theme. I think we just published um, a snippet on our LinkedIn about this specifically, the question of humility. And contrary to popular belief, they are actually not mutually exclusive, humility and assertiveness. And assertiveness. Mm -hmm. They can actually amplify each other and uh, enhance their effectiveness if you do it the right way. So you say that uh, your combination is you do more of the, the left-hand jabs before you actually deliver the, the, the right hook, right? So exactly. you deliver value, value, you look for the business and at the right time, you try to deliver the right idea to the right people. Well, and, and no is also an answer. I mean, if someone just doesn't want to take the bait, then uh, tough luck uh, and, and you can try next time. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's why having an ego doesn't really help you uh, in, in being successful in data and analytics, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you speak a language that's hard to understand uh, to people who already have a lot of things on their minds. 
So I think a little bit of humility is, is indeed something you can, you can show to be successful. Mm -hmm. And how important do you think in general relationships are? So a lot of times when people talk about data and analytics, you see tools, you see technology and numbers and stats. Um, but at the end of the day, it boils down to how can you provide value to living, breathing human beings? I mean, if you just mm -hmm. think about the company itself, if you want to define the company, that will be the collective in, of, of individuals working towards a common goal. I mean, I think that's what the definition of, of a company is, the, the Latin root. So uh, how important were relationships during your career and especially in data analytics? Um, well, if, if you want to try something new and do something new, which might not be new, but at least it's new to some others, um, I think the relationship is the one thing that allows you to get airtime for floating your ideas. Um, it's, um, uh, it's what you need uh, to, uh, to build up some credit uh, before you start doing experiments that might also fail, uh, which of course will cost you credit. Um, so building those relationships um, is, is super important with your stakeholders if you want to be successful uh, towards the business. Um, uh, building those relationships in the data and, analy data and analytics community in Waterfall is, of course, also super important. Um, uh, my experience is that there's a lot to share. There's a lot to gain from the experience of others. Uh, so for me, having that network and, and, and understanding how others use certain tools, how they do certain things, uh, what kind of processes they use, uh, uh, how experimental they are or what they've already created that I can reuse is, of course, super valuable. Um, and then, of course, uh, having the uh, relationships with the, with the outside community, uh, with the professionals, with the consultants, uh, with the other companies, I think that's super valuable inspiration that you can always use to, um, to, uh, to incorporate in, in, into the story that you want to tell to the people you want to convince. Um, mm -hmm. um, because you don't always have to uh, uh, discover the language for yourself, right? You can always quote others. Um, and that's just fine. I, I, I mean, at least I don't have a problem with stealing with pride uh, mm -hmm. instead of coming up with something that is really poorly formulated or, or, uh, or, or, uh, or conceived. Mm -hmm. And we already touched on this, but maybe I want to linger a little bit. So yeah. relationships, um, what were the keys for you to build these strong relationships? We already mentioned empathy. Uh, I mean, we didn't really articulate uh, empathy specifically, but when you think about how to translate something that might be foreign for an individual, you need empathy to be able to understand where they yeah. are coming from and see things from, from uh, that perspective. So that's just an example, but what were some of the other key elements of your uh, relationship building and, and the success of this, that now you have actually a community within the business, which can be a fertile ground for you to plan the stories. And we can talk about the stories later. Yeah, I think for me, uh, patience always works. Uh, I understand that results need to be delivered, uh, but sometimes people just need some time to swallow a new idea and, and, and try something new. Um, and, and that's just fine with me. Um, um, uh, so, so patience is, is really important. Um, it, it also shows that you respect the world of someone else uh, and the priorities that he or she has, uh, some of the problems that he or she might have. Um, uh, and showing patience means that you allow someone to also say no, or maybe yes, but later. Um, so, so patience. I think imagination is another one that's really important. Um, ultimately, you need to be able to show someone what the future could look like if he or she would go along with your idea or your proposal. Um, and if you, if you cannot um, convey this this message of what the future could bring, yeah, then, then why would someone go along with it, right? Um, it's not, if I have something new I want to try, it's not the responsibility of the other to say yes. It's my responsibility to get a yes. Um, uh, and, and, and I think, but then we're back to humility. Um, I think this humility is also a very important part of how you can build those relationships. Um, and finally, um, uh, it's it's sometimes hard for me to do podcasts because it uh, requires me to talk a lot, but I like to listen a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, I once read, uh, if you uh, uh, talk, you repeat what you already know, but if you listen, then you can learn. 
so that's why I like to listen a lot. Uh, I listen to those people who I ultimately need in order to be successful in my job. Uh, and, and if I can understand what it is that they have to say and what their priorities are and with what kind of issues they're struggling, uh, then, then I think those are the opportunities I can cover in order to be successful with the things that I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. well, it's a really interesting trifecta there, right? So as a leader, as, as you said very accurately, that the burden is on you as a leader, not the person that you're trying to lead, because that's what you're doing when you're trying to convince someone of an idea. Yeah. The role of the leader is to paint that aspirational vision that others can buy into and with confidence step into as well. So that burden is on you and that res uh, that responsibility. And if you can take a posture of humility and mm -hmm. patience and can also listen, that makes you an attractive leader. People actually come to you and open up to you. And that's where the healthy relationships happen. So yeah. this is a really important point that you made about listening. So to understand someone, to understand where they are coming from so that you can actually see the world from their eyes then that obviously allows you to give them better value. How do you go about it? personally? Uh, what do you like to listen to? What are you looking for when you, when you talk to someone? And I know it's, it doesn't need to be super intentional all the time. It's more about opening yourself up. Uh, but what are those things that in a data analytics context, you like to watch out for in terms of their desires, goals, challenges? Are there any particular things that you, that, that you look for when, when, when you listen? Um, in, I, I come from the from the world of business development and innovation and uh, when you do customer development and you go out into the world and speak with real customers uh, you're not allowed to pitch your solution you need to start asking questions about their reality um, and, and uh, if you're lucky then there's a connection bet between what you have in mind and, and the problems that, problems that they uh, that they experience um, and, and I think that's my approach also in, in, uh, in, in those talks with the people I need to be successful. Um, uh, so it starts with a very simple question like, how are you and how are things going? Um, uh, because you want to have a conversation about how the business is developing, uh, assuming that you, right, you serve the business and, and their needs um, and you want to make the company more successful. Then that's, I guess, the starting point. Um, uh, and for me, it sounds really simple, but for me, asking open questions uh, is what works the best because uh, every other question uh, can easily be perceived as your attempt to, 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 to turn the conversation into something that's beneficial for you only, uh, right? Or, or pitch a solution. Um, uh, and, and I think that's, that's never a good thing to, uh, to see happening. So, um, so it's so it's 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 not very complicated for me, at least, uh, and it's not very scientifically proven, I guess. Uh, but just being very sincerely interested in someone and the situation he or she is in is often a very good starting point to um, to get to get to the right things that you need to do in order to build a good relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the high quality questions and the low quality yeah. questions. Right, so high quality usually open ended. It opens up new avenues for the conversation. Yes. Yeah, and let's let's not take the uh, take the LinkedIn cold acquisition approach uh, that we all experience uh, so often uh, these days, um, where someone approaches you and says, "Hey, I've got a good solution. Here's my uh, Calendly. Uh, you can you can plan a meeting with me whenever you're ready." Uh, th that's just not how it works. At least not in my very old fashioned forty four year old way. Um, uh, you need to show some sincere interest in what's happening in the world around you. Uh, if you want to be successful in your own world. Mm, mm. It's interesting also that sometimes you can use uh, these questions that might be more of a yes or no situation, but that happens already when you establish that there is something that is worthy of exchange, that there, that can be value exchanged here. And then it's yeah. mainly just getting that final commitment of, will that be beneficial for you? Do you want to jump on board? Do you want to... Do you want to pull the trigger? Do you want to go ahead, right? I think the most ideal situation that you can have in a, in a scene of customer development is that ultimately by asking open questions, you come to the point where the customer discovers the solution for you. So I don't mind having my stakeholders uh, discover the solution that I already wanted to build for them. Um, uh, that's just fine. That, that means that you have quick alignment and, and, and easy alignment 
about it, what it is that you want to achieve together in the future. And, 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 and that's for me really the core of, 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 of working together. It's together, right? It's, it's not just about what I want to achieve um, uh, or what I think is good for the company. Ultimately, it's something that we need to align together uh, uh, with the strategy and the mission uh, and, and make that a, a very successful combination. Hmm. Yeah, letting them discover the solution that's so absolutely uh, so important. And what we found, and this is one of the reasons why we actually uh, named the brand the Data Storytellers. That we have it used to be the Innovation Community, which it it, it says something about it being a group of individuals, senior professionals who like to innovate. But what we found is that at the end of the day, as you very accurately said, you need to let people find these solutions themselves and step into into them themselves the best yeah. way to the best way to do this is by painting that vision and stories are absolutely essential when you do that so how important were stories during your career and how important do you think stories are for the data professional today well i think very important i mean uh, it, it depends a bit on your definition of story of course uh, but uh, what, what I remember when I first uh, joined procurement and I had my first pitch in front of the management team, um, I showed what, what we already did in uh, the other B, uh, business area where I was working for um, uh, and, and showed the procurement professionals what you can do with data uh, and, and, and how the world is changing as a result of data. So, for example, I, I, um, um, I showed them some, uh, some tools with which you can anal uh, analyze LinkedIn profiles. Uh, might not be very pr privacy or GDPR friendly, uh, but at least it gave them a very good indication of what you can do with those tools. I also used, I remember, the, uh, the IBM Watson uh, 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 tools, uh, which you just can use on the website uh, to show how one a very tiny piece of text can already predict a lot about who you are and, and how you behave. Uh, and, and that story uh, was apparently so impressive uh, that it almost gave me a blank check to start working with data in procurement. Of course, then the most important step follows because you need to uh, deliver on the promise. Um, uh, so you need to deliver the results in order to make the story really successful. But it starts with the story, not with a, with a series of bullet points of what needs to be achieved in order to be successful. That, I, I don't think that will work. Mm. And what do you think makes a, makes a good story? And, and we don't need to go into incredible depth. You know, we're, we're not trying to direct a movie. Uh, so it's good to just stick to the fundamentals and, uh, and, and the simplest tools and, and the, the most simple easily digestible frameworks. Uh, but what do you think? What, what do you think makes a good data story when you want to give someone an example of how results can be achieved in the future? How do you like to construct your story? Well, I, I like to, uh, for me, it's simple. It always starts with a problem and it, and it ends with uh, what the future could look like um, uh, and, and then different scenarios of how to get there um, uh, with different levels of ambition. Uh, because, of course, the bigger the ambition, the bigger the budget needed. Uh, and, and, and then you end up usually in, uh, in, in, in troubles. Um, so it starts with a problem and, and, then with a, uh, and it ends with a vision. Um, I think it, it should also be very clear in a very simple, uh, simple way, in a very digestible way, how you aim to achieve your goal. Um, so I don't want to bother many of my stakeholders with a very technical story of how we're going to predict the future. Uh, I will just tell them there is a technology that can help us predict the future. It works more or less in this way, uh, like you had in, in, in university when you did math. Uh, uh, but now it's automated uh, and we're going to use it to fix this and that problem. Uh, and it will lead to this and that result. Mm, and It's nothing more, mm. nothing less. Uh, it's super simple and because simple is easy to digest. And again, people already have so many things on their mind and need to speak so many different languages. I'm not going to bother them with very technical speak unless they're interested, of course, because then I'd be happy to explain. Mm -hmm. And how does it make your life easier then? So as a professional, when you are trying to implement uh, new solutions, um, how do you think that actually helps you? Is it only about, uh, I don't know, preparing the field so that people are... Uh, more open to just buying into your solutions or are you looking for something more specific? So in general, how, how do good stories help your life as a data analytics professional? 
Well, then, then I, I think I will get back to to the uh, the thing I've said before. It, it's about making people understand what it's all about, what data analytics is all about. I think there are many who still don't really speak the language and understand what it is that you can do with data and and, and understand that we've now come to a level of maturity and, and technology level uh, where we can just, I mean, anyone could just use one of the machine learning tools that is now available on the internet for free and do their own predictions. Um, I think there are many who still don't know uh, because not it's, it's, it, it has always been a bit of a, of a scene uh, where the uh, techies and, and maybe the, maybe, uh, sorry, no disrespect meant here, but the, the nerdy uh, numbers people uh, can be seen and can be found. Um, uh, to which not always every manager or, or VP or, or executive can relate to. Um, uh, so I think I think that's uh, that's that's really important. That's how, that's how the data and analytics life can become easier. Always try to adapt to the uh, uh, to the world that your stakeholder lives in, and try to speak his or her language, uh, because then you will be successful. Then the story will also come across. Uh, the the more you make data speak. Uh, the harder it will be to understand. Hmm. Well, I, think I mean, and, and, and for example, if you, if you buy a car, um, well, at least if I buy a car, I'm never very much interested in how the engine works or how certain technologies lead to a perfect driving result. I don't care. I just want to be comfortable in something that offers a lot of space and that will bring me from A to B in, in a very nice way. Um, and, and I think that's what drives me in telling my stories. I want to make it a comfortable experience, what we're going to do together. Uh, and uh, please leave all the detailed stuff to the specialists, uh, uh, which is also very helpful for me because I'm not the specialist. So that means that I don't have to struggle on a technical story, which I can't really share anyway. Mm, fantastic. I think that's actually a great note to uh, finish on because I think th this just encapsulates so much about what makes a data analytics professional successful when you can take that perspective of the non-technical user and speak their language and then successfully deliver value through that approach. So thank you very much for the interview, Aryan. As a, as a, as, as a final uh, piece of advice to data analytics professionals, what would you recommend them to focus on, adopt? Uh, what would be your personal piece of recommendation for data analytics leaders today? Well, I think focus on the business results, you know, be, be humble and be aware of for whom you're working, uh, but don't lose your lack of, sorry, don't lose your imagination um, uh, because that will ultimately make a difference uh, and will make you successful uh, in your data and analytics field because that's when you can really surprise the stakeholders with something new they could have never come up with themselves. Mm. To under promise, over deliver with pleasant surprises. Always. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Arian. It's been an excellent interview and all the best to you. Hope to see you sometime in the future in uh, one of these podcasts. Thanks. And again, thanks for having me. It was great fun and uh, looking forward to, uh, to listening to uh, more of you in the future. Mm -hmm.